Scott Sager with you again. I want to thank you for joining us here on RTC TV4. Today we have the second congressional district candidate on the Democratic ticket in uh, the next month's primary coming up. And uh, this is Yatish Josie. That's correct. correct. Okay, yes. I got his name correct. <laughs> now you're from the South Bend area, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, you immigrated to the United States in? 1976 from Mumbai or Bombay, India. Excellent, excellent. Now when you came to the United States... You worked, but then you eventually owned your own company, correct? Yes, sir. What's the name of that company? Uh, GTA Containers, Inc. Excellent, excellent. Well, if you haven't, go to his website. These containers are incredible. They're actually... Uh, they're, they're collapsible containers is used for storage of drinking water or fuel yeah. or liquid fertilizers or the salt brand for winter roads. Yeah. Uh, they're flexible, so when you use it, you ready to use? Yeah. And when you finish, you full, put in the box, fold it up, put in the box, and take it with you. I so that it. temporary rapid deployment. I love so it. this is very good for U.S. military. Absolutely. Rapid deployment because they just go in, have the fuel or water as they're moving forward. Right. When they're done, they fold it up, put in the crate, and they move out quickly. It's, it, they're it's, very lightweight. Yeah. Very durable. Well, they're, they're very neat, and uh, for our agriculture folks out there, imagine a silo that you can, when you're done filling it, you can collapse it, put it in a box, and take it to your next place. It's it's very neat, and they're very large, too. That's good. Yeah, size is small size of 55 gallons. Wow. All the up to 210,000 gallons. 210,000 gallons, my goodness. Well, that's very neat. Now, what year did you start that? I started in 1988. Okay. But the important thing to remember about me coming from Bombay, India, mm -hmm. about 1976. Yeah. Just a little bit background about what happened, my experience with American people. Yeah. Is, to me, it so changed my life. Yeah. Let's put it this way. Yeah. So I came in December 23rd, 1976. Okay. Landed JFK. I didn't know a single person in this country. <laughs> not a single person. So, but one elderly lady was struggling, carrying her heavy bag. Right. So I offered my help. I said, yeah, please, uh, my children's waiting outside the custom. So I helped her back, went outside the custom, and children thanked me. And they asked me, uh, Yatis, what is your plan? So I had no plan. I'm going to stay at the airport right. and get the ground bus to Akron, Ohio, where I'm going to do my graduate study in polymer science. Okay. And they said, oh, no, 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 no. Come to us. Come with us to their house. So they took me to their house. <laughs> your first day in America. Very first day, very first <laughs> evening, just about a Half hour, yeah, right. less than half hour. So I went to their house, they treated me very well, warm bed, warm food. On the Christmas Eve, her son took me to the Greyhound bus station. Uh -huh. I had a traveler's check to buy a ticket. And America, they don't take traveler's checks. Right. They take only cash. Right. Or credit card. <laughs> so I had no cash. On Christmas Eve. On the Christmas Eve. So he loaned me $200. He gave oh, me $200. Oh my gosh. And I said, I will send it back to you. He said, no, no, don't worry about it. This is totally strange, $200. So I sit in the bus uh, and sit next to the, this young white girl going to Akron, Ohio uh -huh. for visit her parents for Christmas. Right. And so we start talking and she couldn't able to pronounce my name. So she called me Joe. <laughs> Say Joe. So as we are approaching Akron, so what is your plan? She maybe I'll go to a hotel, find some place. Oh, no, no, no. Come to our house. Our parents <laughs> will love you. So she took me to her parents' house, and they were hard-working, blue-collar, mm -hmm. American, this I discovered later on. Mm -hmm. As soon as they saw me, they, welcome, Joe, welcome, so happy to see me. <laughs> on the Christmas day, they asked me if I would like to come to the church. Oh my gosh. And I've never been to church in my life. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so I went to the church in Akron, Ohio. Uh, the church was so huge, yeah. maybe 5,000 people. Right. Maybe I was the only brown guy in the whole church. <laughs> sure. It was an amazing experience. Anyway, so we visited different their family members. Every single person was so polite, so kind, so nice to me. And then she left to New York next day. Mm -hmm. But her parents, is she told her parents, Mom and Dad, Joe is going to stay with you. <laughs> because my school is not going to start for another two weeks. Oh, my gosh. So, she, Mom, Mom parents said, no problems. So she left for New York. And so every day I look in the newspaper for looking for apartment. Uh -huh. But they say, oh, no, no, this is too expensive, too far, bad neighborhood. So they won't let me go. Right. Just day before my school started, they said, Joe, we found your apartment for you. Walking to the campus, very reasonable rent. We sound good, so I pick up my bag and we go. On the way to apartment, we stop at the grocery store. Uh -huh. 
and they brought whole week of ghostly for oh, me. Oh my God. And they a lot of the ghostly for me in my kitchen, in the apartment. <laughs> now, I'm telling you, this type of experience, you cannot find any part of the world. Right. This is American people. I love that. And that is the difference. And that's one of the reasons I'm running for Congress. Yeah. To my way, if I can pay back to people, and my community, my district. That is amazing. Yeah. That is probably one of the best stories I've heard about America. And it gives me some pride and some hope. Yeah. You were in the country less than three weeks. You had, with being here within hours, you were spending the night with an American who you started by helping them. Yes. They helped you. That led to more help, more hospitality. I love it. And, and the fact that it's here in the Midwest, you know, Akron, Ohio, we'll consider that's that right. in the Midwest. Midwest. Exactly. That's Midwestern hospitality for you there. But that is an incredible story. Now, you what, what got you into South Bend, Indiana, or, or up in that area? I think after completing my master degree, mm -hmm. I met my wife. We got married, and while doing my uh, PhD, okay. I got a job offer from Tennessee. Okay, so me and my wife talk, and we decided maybe let's get a job, make some money, and then I'll come in, finish my PhD later on. Right, I'm still waiting for that day to come. <laughs> <laughs> so I worked in Tennessee, Johnson City, Tennessee, for a couple of years. Okay, and I got laid off. No. Oh. Just day after we bought our first house, oh. we had no money. We couldn't pay our electric bill. Mm -hmm. So we, when my wife huddled up in blanket, mm -hmm. in one cold room, watching our five-inch TV. <laughs> and then once a week, we used to go to Dunkin' Donuts okay. to share a cup of coffee. Oh my goodness. We had no money to buy two cups. So we share one cup of coffee. Yeah. And that was the highlight of our week. So next seven, eight years, we really struggled job to job, mm -hmm. uh, uncertainty. We in the time with three children, Georgina, Tenzing, and Avatar. And finally, I worked in South, I got a job in Goshen, Indiana, okay. this, to Midwest. And then Goshen, I went to Mishwaka. Uh -huh. I worked for uh, Union Royal, okay. a large corporation. Yes. I worked there for six years. Okay. And then uh, they went bankrupt because not there is no enough work or not good employees. The employees are so loyal, mm -hmm. so loyal. Mm -hmm. But they had unfunded pension liabilities. Mm. So instead of paying their workers, mm -hmm. they folded. They folded. Mm -hmm. So they destroyed the town of Mishwaka at mm -hmm. that time. It was let me ruin yeah. two thousand employees. Right. They lost their pension. They lost health insurance. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so I, it was. I can see right in front of me, but there's nothing I can do about it. Mm -hmm. So I got moved to back in Ohio mm -hmm. to go to job with the BF Goodrich and work for the couple of years. Mm -hmm. And they were doing the same thing. Yeah. So my wife finally said, yeah, this, this is the way we can grow our family. Mm -hmm. We need some stability. Mm -hmm. Let's start the job. And we love South Bend area very much. Mm -hmm. South Bend, Mishwaka, Goshen, Alcat. Mm -hmm. So we started the business in South Bend. And because of our life experience, yeah. we started our business on the west side of South Bend. Okay. That is really economically challenged area. Mm -hmm. low, low income neighborhood, yeah. lots of black, lots of Latinos, mm -hmm. no work, no economic. So we started over there to help people. That's like great. the way I got help. Yeah. And I remember so vividly that my employee from surrounding neighborhood walked to the work. Mm -hmm. Today, mm -hmm. they come by cars. Yes. They used to live in a rundown apartments. Yeah. Now they can afford to buy the house. Yeah. And at GTA, in 1985, so we started our business in 1988. Okay. By 1995, we realized that we made it. Uh -huh. We will succeed. Mm -hmm. So first thing we did, and my wife insisted, we provided 100% company-funded health insurance. Wow. And retirement profit sharing plan for each and every employee. Wow. Since 1995, and we still do. You still do, do that. today. We still do that. One hundred percent of the insurance for your employees, and a hundred percent retirement provision for anywhere from three percent to seven percent of their salaries every year go in the savings account because we know it's so hard to save money mm -hmm. when you live paycheck to paycheck, mm -hmm. and that's where their income is building, mm -hmm. their wealth is building. You talk on your website a little bit about um, corporations, a lot of them in the United States and quite frankly worldwide now paying what we consider a starvation wage. That's correct. Just enough to sustain you. As long as you come to work tomorrow, that's all we care about. We, we, 
and you've taken the exact opposite approach in your business. You're giving as much as you possibly can, and in return, your employees are giving as much as they possibly can. And I can tell you very honestly, I'm succeeded. Mm -hmm. I'm succeeded because of my employees. Yeah. And, and that's true for every company, whether they want to admit it or not. That's correct. It's true for every company. Yeah. Because they work on the floor mm -hmm. day in, day out. They know how the thing works. Yeah. I always talk with my employees, how about doing that way? Yeah. And I don't mind. They say, no, no, this is a bad idea. Right. And they come to me, how about doing this way? I say, wow. Yeah. Why? I didn't thought about it. Right. Let's do it. Yeah. So I work with my employees. And the important thing is that it doesn't make you all white or black or Latino. Right. 80% of my employees are blacks and Latinos. Sure. And uh, we pay equal pay to men and the women. Right. We treat our employee equally. Right. And what happened is that they feel so good about themselves. Sure. And we pay living wages. Yes. You know, $7.25 minimum wage right. is uh, disgusting. Correct? It is. It is. How can family can survive? You cannot pay one rent. Right. So I'm advocating very strongly in my platform. If mm -hmm. I, when I become a congressman next year, mm -hmm. The, I'm going to introduce minimum federal wages should be minimum fifteen dollars an hour. Fifteen dollars. Fifteen dollars an hour. And if you would really put the inflation index on the unemployment mm -hmm. minimum wages, it should be twenty three dollars an hour. Mm -hmm. But we don't do that. No. We so so if you just maintainably as is should be fifteen dollars. Yeah. Because I throughout the second district I traveled for the last several months, mm -hmm. I told so many people and they're doing two jobs and mm -hmm. three jobs. They're working 80 week. hours a week and they're barely making barely the making week. And they're living minimally. Minimally, exactly. Mm -hmm. And something goes wrong, for example, car breaks down or child yeah. gets sick. Yeah. You get even more in that. Yeah. So if you make 50 an hour, you have some money to save mm -hmm. for rainy days. Mm -hmm. Instead of working two jobs and three jobs, you can do one job. Mm -hmm. So there is more time in the family. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. this is such a beautiful thing people don't realize. Mm -hmm. When families are together and happy, the child, they spend more time with their children, yes. and children, happy children, go to school, yes. they're going to learn more. Yes. And you know you are happy because your child is happy. Yes. When you go to your work, yes. you'll be more efficient, That's more right. productive. Something as simple as raising the minimum wage, which I understand the repercussions to the profit on the other end, the stockholders or whatnot, at least in the beginning, there's a concern of raising it that high. But... The chain reaction of the quality of life improvement across the board for every citizen of Indiana and the United States is just incredible. That's guys, quality of life, that should be our purpose, correct? Yes. We all living and working That's to great. improve our quality of life. But there is a myth that there is a initially high price for the corporation, mm -hmm. the profit will go down. Right. I mean, that's not true. You think that, a myth. that by doing it, you're going to increase productivity, happiness, overall then and the, your profits will still be there. As an employee, you are more efficient, more productive. Mm -hmm. That means corporate is going to make more money. That's right. If you make more money, you can get more jobs, do more things mm -hmm. for your employees. And number two, the labor cost mm -hmm. is just portion of the final cost. Right. For example, you take a Big Mac. Mm -hmm. In Seattle, a okay, Big Mac cost $5.38 mm -hmm. when the minimum wage was $7.25. Mm -hmm. And everybody said, oh my God, if you increase $15, mm -hmm. the price will just double. That's not true. Right. The McDonald's price went up, Mac, Big Mac price went up by only 19 cents. 19 only cents. by 4 cents. Because the cost of the Big Mac mm -hmm. is because of burns, meat, mm -hmm. condominium, mm -hmm. overhead, lights, fixed cost. Mm -hmm. And labor is a portion of it. Mm -hmm. So labor is only went by 4%. But the employee wages went up by 100%. Mm -hmm. That means the employee can spend more. Right. And when the employee has more money, they spend more, our economy is going to grow. That's right. It just spirals into a better economy all the way around. So if the large corporation, other people, this narrow-minded, mm -hmm. radicalized class conservatives mm -hmm. uh, open the mind and realize benefit of minimum wage. Great. So yeah. why? And most important thing, you put in the quality of life. Yes. That is important. Thing. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Shift over to, for a second here. Uh, Michelle Livinghouse is with us today. Michelle, what's your involvement here? My involvement... Uh, started a little bit early in October when I first saw a video on Facebook of Yatish and um, kind of just put it in the back of my mind for a couple months. Uh, met him in Marshall County briefly one day and then I think it was uh, January when you went down to file in the legislature. Yes. Uh, you went down to the legislature. He went down to Indianapolis <laughs> to <laughs> file <laughs> his candidacy okay. and the day he did that he took about 30 people with him, many young people. Uh -huh. 
uh, to lobby the Indiana legislature for uh, giving um, driver's licenses and in-state tuition to um, Indiana uh, colleges to um, DREAMers and DACA recipients. Excellent. And um, this interested me. I'm working um, with some people that are working on some immigration issues sure. in Plymouth. Okay. And that was something I felt very strongly about. Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of legislation was actually proposed in 2016 mm -hmm. by Senator Lannon in the Indiana legislature. And as you know, uh, with the gerrymandered legislature, that legislation wasn't going anywhere. Okay. Uh, it was something I proposed that I would, should I have gone to the legislature, <laughs> that I would have co-sponsored. I see. And I was so amazed that this man not only was filing his candidacy for Congress, but he was going a step further. He was involving these young people, many young people. They were all young people. There were some older people. Too. I'm only 45, just so you know. <laughs> that that too, went down to do something <laughs> constructive uh, in our state right. at the same time. Um, kind of pulled the spotlight off of himself a little by doing that as did. well and, and shown it, it on the issue. I could not not support this man. Excellent. I was just overwhelmed. I was sitting with a friend, a couple of friends, actually my daughter, one day um, when I was told that he did this. I hadn't seen it. And he said, look at, uh, this friend said, look this up. you got to look this up. See what he did. I said, well, what did, what did, what were they lobbying for? Uh -huh. And he said, I don't know. I don't think I know that, but I think it's pretty cool that they did it. And I looked it up and I said, I have to do it. I have Good to support you. this man. And I started messaging um, some of the people Great. on his uh, campaign. And one of the messages I got back was, we have a young, diverse group mm -hmm. that is working for Yatish Joshi. And I said, well, then you need this old grandma to help you out. <laughs> <laughs> Experience is everything, so uh, that's great. Well, You, you know buy... about his driver's license? Yeah. This, we know the undocumented immigrants, they work. Sure. And they provide so much over economy. Mm -hmm. So they're driving without driver's license. Mm -hmm. So they're always driving under fear. Mm -hmm. If they know the accident, mm -hmm. they don't. There is no incentive for them to stop. Right, they'll because run. They know they'll they will run. Mm -hmm. okay. So what happens? So many accidents happen, mm -hmm. and our uninsured motorist insurance goes up mm -hmm. because we have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. But it is such a eye opening. Right? If you provide a driver license to them, we know they are working. Right, give them driver license. Right, then you create the state revenue, mm -hmm. so they can drive safely. Mm -hmm. and legally and responsibly. Now and we now we have them. We're in a position where. We know their license number. We know who they are. They have to hold the same responsibility that every other citizen every, does. Exactly. And mm -hmm. number two, they have to buy the insurance, just yes. like you and me do. Yes. So that means we are creating revenue. Yeah. We are creating economy upwards, mobility. Interesting. Absolutely. I mean, and why? Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean they have become citizen. Right. It just means they're working. They're contributing so much to our economy. Right. And in return, they're not getting anything back. Right. Absolutely. We, you know, one of the things that I'll bring up here as well, we're in north central Indiana. And I guarantee you, when we're watching the news up here and we hear about immigration issues, we automatically think of Texas, Florida, Arizona, and New Mexico, California. We do not think of Indiana. But there are thousands, if you, this is, uh, don't quote me on any numbers, you'll have to look it up yourself, but there are thousands and thousands of undocumented workers performing jobs in our communities every day in North Central India. And they're performing job every day, mm -hmm. and they're performing beautifully. Yes. They're doing it very efficiently, yes. working very, very hard. Yes. And, and, and they're paying the taxes. Yes. They pay Social Security, federal tax, state, yes. city, everything. Contributing to Contributing us. to yes. our tax system. Yes. And in return, what they get? Yes. They don't go to anything. Right. Well, I think one of the things you're doing here is you're providing if nothing else, value. And that's one thing that I, I had a superintendent of the schools in here a few weeks ago, and their school continues to have vo vocational education, building trades, automotive classes. And we talked about how we went through a trend where if you didn't go to college, you didn't have value. And we talked about how 
there are plumbers and welders making more money than dentists and doctors in some cases. And that I was proud of their school because to me that showed that they valued all of the students, not just the ones going to college. And I, I, I think that you've taken that same concept and you've expanded it to the entire population of Indiana to said, we value all of you. You all have value. Um, we tend to be in a throwaway society. I can go watch or uh, buy a washing machine from the big box store, and if it breaks next year, I throw it away and buy a new one. But um, we've tried to translate that over into society where you don't have value, so I'll move on to the next person. And, and what I'm hearing from you today is that you appreciate the value that each person in America is bringing to the table, and specifically here in North Central Indiana. That's absolutely, great. Absolutely correct, because the, our trade school, uh, every job, we have to have plumbers. Yes. We need electrician, we need a welder. Yeah. You know, there are 1,000 welder shortages right now. Really? In, South, in St. Joseph County. A shortage of over 1,000 welders. 4,000. Wow. There are 10,000 job openings yeah. in Elkhart County. I might and have then, to learn welding, and I'll so tell you that. That's correct. <laughs> and welding is a high paying job. You're yes, making twenty five, thirty dollars an hour. Yes, an hour. That's and a good the, life. And then we should teach our trade school in high schools. Yes. And what happens if you partnership with our local industries mm -hmm. yeah. and create the curriculum, school create the curriculum for yeah. our industries. Yeah. So and industry pay for the, the labs and training centers. Yep. And so we can train our students to work for the industries mm -hmm. so they can work in the summer doing interns internships. That's exactly right. So student learning the value of coming on time, yep. punching on seven o'clock. Absolutely. Or seven learning their work ethic. Like work ethic, working mm -hmm. with the other employees. Yeah. Working as a group. Yeah. It's benefit for everybody. Yes, so local does. industries has constant supply of trained employees. Yeah. As a student. And students are guaranteed job. Yeah. They come out of school, they have a job. Yeah. So trade school is so critical. We, our public school must work with the unions yes. to set up the trade school, uh, the training center for carpentry, mm -hmm. electrician. Mm -hmm. For example, drone technology, mm -hmm. that we can do there. Yes. Solar power, they're repairing. Yes. So many opportunities there. And the point is that not everybody wants to go to college. Right. Four years, they can't afford to go. Right. So they can go to trade school. Yes. And, and still they're going to succeed. Yes. Because, and this is not a job skill, this is a lifelong skill. That's right. That's because important. It's so important, correct? Because if you lost your job for some reason, for example, right. you had the skill, you can start your own business. Right. You can survive yep. without depending on the other people. That's right. On the safety net. So That's great. Yeah. That's great. Other parts of your platform you would like to talk about at all? Oh my God, I do talk about so many things. <laughs> and I know you have a lunch date, yes, so I, I don't want to keep you too long. Yeah, I want to talk about number one, mm -hmm. uh, the marijuana. Mm -hmm. Opioid crisis. Yeah, talk about uh, it. I want to decriminalize marijuana. Okay. I'm the only candidate saying we to decriminalize marijuana. So now, do you want to legalize it or simply decriminalize it? Decriminalize. Okay. So that means it's legalized. That anybody okay. anybody can use anytime they want. So it'll be taxed. They'll be taxed. So okay. you can create the revenue. Okay. Exactly. So with the revenue, you can do lots of research and R&D. Mm -hmm. And because of, because of marijuana has a good pain relieving effect, mm -hmm. just like opioids. Has medical purposes. Has medical purposes. Mm -hmm. So people who the pain, mm -hmm. depression, mm -hmm. they take the marijuana. Mm -hmm. You can see, you don't go to pharmacy to get the opioids. Mm -hmm. You can grow marijuana in your own house, mm -hmm. in, your, in your yard. Yeah. Six to 12 plants, just like Michigan. So you think that the marijuana, um, le by legalizing it, and if not recreationally, at least medically, we will relieve some of the pressure on the opioid epidemic. I think I really believe not medically, mm -hmm. recreational, rec complete across the board, across the board. Okay, because then we don't need policing. Mm -hmm. The important thing is that opioid crisis. I, I believe very strongly will eliminate mm -hmm. because people take opioid because there's so much pain. Right, and opioid so addictive. So and then you take more and more and more, and there's so many deaths. Overdose with opioids. Right, and we're seeing some states, um, by the way, and I, I, I like Colorado. Right, we're seeing some states where opioid use has gone down since they've legalized the marijuana. Correct. That's exactly, okay. and okay. and as as of today, there's not a single death for overdose from marijuana. Okay, but there are hundreds of thousands, thousands. of deaths. Yeah. And, and look at the marijuana considered as class A substance mm -hmm. ban, but alcohol. It's not. It's right. open, and there are eighty-eight thousand deaths from from right. alcohol. Right. So what's the difference? Right. 
So yeah, day number one. And, and I've heard others talk about this. I won't pontificate on this too much, but one of the thoughts is, is that the empirical data, the truth, the facts of it are that marijuana is misclassified yes. and that it should be classified differently. If not completely legally, it should still be classified differently than it is. Do you think it's fear, just a general fear of change or fear that we're going to increase numbers? Why haven't other states jumped on this? I just read this. Colorado brought in no, excuse me, $1.2 billion in marijuana revenue last year. That's good. Taxes was something like $285 million yeah. on that. That is still only about a third of their economy. Um, Colorado is not a huge marijuana economy, but... They are one of the largest in the country. $285 million goes a long way to the state. You can build schools. You can fix roads. You can do other things. And what they did in Colorado was they weighed that to say, yeah, we're going to try this to see what happens. I'm not seeing overcrowding of jails in the state of Colorado with people doing bad things while they're smoking the marijuana. You're not seeing uh, major medical epidemics because they've legalized it. So I think that now that they've put it in action, others can look in on Colorado and say, what's really happening? What's the truth of what's going to happen if other states legalize this? Some want the money, and that's all they want. They want the tax revenue from it. But you want to tax revenue, that's correct. Mm -hmm. But by doing that, you create such a positive effect on the population. Right. Definitely, you're going to reduce the prison mm -hmm. overcrowding. Right. Because 80% of people in prison having a purchase of marijuana. Really? Small amount. 80%. 80%. And we pay, we spend $80 billion per year in locking the people up. Wow. $80 billion. And, and this, this purposely affects mm -hmm. blacks and Latinos. Sure. The minority, low income people. Interesting. Instead of treating them as a rehab, mm -hmm. as a medical problem, mm -hmm. but we lock them up. Interesting. $80 billion. So if you legalize marijuana or decriminalize marijuana mm -hmm. completely, that means, in my my calculation roughly, 80% mm -hmm. of the population of the prison will be reduced. Mm -hmm. Okay? Then you can save $60 billion just locking the people up. Right. So that $60 billion, we can do so many things, right? Yeah. So we make better healthcare, better jobs, better yeah. education. Yeah. And people become responsible. Mm -hmm. Because when you trust people, they're going to do much better than you don't trust them and just lock them up. That's right. And, and they're going to have a positive effect on black communities. Mm -hmm. Their father will be back with their child. Mm -hmm. You're always a single mother raising mm -hmm. their child. They're going to unite the family. Mm -hmm. We're going to bring back our American value back. Mm -hmm. And the marijuana is decriminalized, starting from the Nixon era. Mm -hmm. In Nixon era, they did a study. He, Nixon himself. Asked for the study to uh, effect of marijuana, mm -hmm. and commission his commission said that marijuana is good and should be legalized. This was during Nixon in the seventies. During Nixon in seventies, and what Nixon did, he went totally opposite hmm. because he wanted his right hand guy, H. R. Haldeman, mm -hmm. one of the crooked guys. Okay, one of the crooked guy. I, in my <laughs> opinion, okay, he wrote his diary that we know the black is a problem. We don't talk about it. We know what to do about it. So they make it drug war on drug mm -hmm. and start locking the black people up. And so this is a pure racism, okay? Right. And the point is that Americans are far better than what we have. And there's a small group of people. Right. It started with the president. There's a problem. And then Reagan came and drug on war. And then came Bill Clinton, mandatory sentence for mm -hmm. 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. We are spending $80 billion. That's we can spend much better way. Okay. So there is one thing. Another important thing, if I have a few minutes. Please. About student debt loan. Yes. There are 50, almost 45 to 55 million people, American, are in the student debt loan. Mm -hmm. I talk to so many people in this second district. Mm -hmm. And everybody says they're paying their student debt loan mm -hmm. for the last 10 years, 50 mm -hmm. years, 20 years. And they will never able to pay it off in mm -hmm. their lifetime. Mm -hmm. One lady, for example, said, so she borrowed $90,000 mm -hmm. to do her PhD. Mm -hmm. And she has a good job. She has a good job. She paying student debt loan for the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. She owes today $147,000. Oh, my gosh. Because the interest is 
piling up the capitalized interest. Right. And U.S. government, our government making 1.6 billion dollars mm-hmm. on the back of students who to make their lives better, and in turn they making our lives better, mm-hmm. our society better. Yeah. So I strongly believe in rocketing that we should forgive student debt load completely without any tax implications. They're going to create. A I'm a fan of that. I've still got student loan debt for my use. So. Exactly, and I bet you. <laughs> you you're those. welcome to it. The government can have it back. I've always been a big fan, and this is my politics. And I excuse me for putting this out there, but I've always firmly believed that education from birth to death should be taken care of. That should be a guaranteed right that we make it available to you, and you can have it at your disposal. I think that that is the silver bullet of most of our problems in this planet: is good education. I mean, what happens? Educated society is well informed, mm-hmm. and in twenty first century, we get high paying jobs. Mm-hmm. So if you go over educated society, yeah. everybody better off. Yes, our community, our country, everybody better off. They do. And so I, I strongly believe, as you, as you believe, the education should be free mm-hmm. from pre K through mm-hmm. college or the trade school. That's right. Yeah, and when you compare, and I, again, I'm not going to get too deep into this. This is your time, not mine. But when you compare what we spend on defense versus what we spend on education, you would think that we don't value education at all um, just because it's so disproportional. And not saying we don't need defended, but, um, well, there are some of my left side views. I'll slide back over to the right side here. But uh, any other thoughts on uh, your campaign? I appreciate it. I didn't know you. I know a lot of folks in 2nd District are just getting to meet you now. Yes, I think another important concern is the environment. Mm. The environment is a real, real issue. Mm-hmm. It is not a Chinese whole like Trump saying. Mm-hmm. That is, he has absolutely no understanding. Right. Is the real issue. The, uh, over recent history, we get a very violent storm, mm-hmm. extremely violent, and more frequently, mm-hmm. is you know, either it because of us, right. we put in emission. Mm-hmm. In Indiana, we use ninety five percent of our electricity produced using coal. Ninety five percent, one of the worst in the whole nation, right. lowest, and coal ashes. They get an exemption; they don't need any liners. Right, so it. We, we could clean it, but the government gave them an exemption so they don't have to. So they can pull over our waters, mm-hmm. our rivers, our lakes yeah. because of that. Right. So if you reduce the coal usage and go toward completely eliminate the subsidies to fossil fuel. Okay. Why we have to pay subsidies to fossil fuel for this large corporation? Right. Multi-billion, multinational company. Mm-hmm. No. Cut out, eliminate subsidies and transfer that to renewable energy, mm-hmm. like a solar panel, mm-hmm. wind energy, electric. Mm-hmm. Use that word. And that is the future of our world. I that see. is the future of our nation. That is the future of Indiana. Indiana can become a leading mm-hmm. in renewable energy. For example, in f- just from the farmland, mm-hmm. they created 46,000 jobs okay. in solar panels. And because of that, we reduce our coal usage uh-huh. from 86%, 86.8% 86. to 68.7%. Wow. That is significant. Almost a 20% drop. That's correct. Wow. So, and, and, and we have technology, we are smart people in the mm-hmm. Midwest. Mm-hmm. Why all the ideas has to come from the, the, from the West? Coast? Yeah. 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 It should be come from center, from yeah. the Midwest, and go out. I like it. That's what we need. Like you know, it. just like my business, my process. Yeah. It's the first small business ever. Delbury Midwest. Yeah. And because of my process, people in Canada, West Coast, East Coast, North and South are using my technology. <laughs> technology came from Midwest. I like it. To make the tanks. Yeah. That's what we need. Well, we're proud Hoosiers and we know that we... we, are. we uh, I, I like the concept of start it here and push it out to the coast instead of having it come back to... And episode. the beauty is that we have talent. Yeah, we do. We have talent. Yeah. And we just encourage to bring them out. Yeah. Well, you know, I've, I've sat here on num- numerous occasions interviewing uh, business leaders from around the area, and we have some of the most inventive and, quite frankly, brave entrepreneurs who are delving in and putting their own money on the line to try to do, whether it's manufacturing or a hospitality business. Um, and I like that entrepreneurial spirit I see here in Indiana, and I think that uh, you're trying to encourage more and more of that, and I like that very much, so... Well, we've had a great time. Um, Michelle, any closing statements on this? I mean, this is your time. You're welcome to endorse oh, your candidate you. here on no, the air. I don't have anything to say <laughs> other than it's it's been a real honor to support Yatish Joshi for Congress. And 
not just an honor, but a, a good time. We've had a great time. Excellent, excellent. Tell everybody your website so that they can go there and find out more about you. Yeah, uh, www. Uh -huh. uh, Joshi for F O R Joshi for Indiana. Okay, Joshi for Indiana dot com. Yes, excellent. And uh, important thing is the there's a primary May eighth. Yes, I hope everybody should come out and vote May eighth for Joshi. It's so important. I think we need about sixty percent, seventy percent, eighty percent turnout. Okay, we don't want ten or twenty percent. Mm -hmm. Then there's no way we can able to make our country better. Right. Elect. That is the power you have. Use your power to elect the person you like. Yeah. And if you like, don't like the person, throw them out. You have every two years, mm -hmm. every four years opportunities. That's right. So please come out and vote May 8th to vote for Joshi. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to meet thank you, you sir. Much. I appreciate, appreciate your, your ideas. Thank you, my dear. Thank you. Well, thank you for tuning in here. We'll have more candidates throughout the uh, political season here on RTC4. I want to thank you again for watching.